Hi everyone, it's the Catholic CEO, Henry Katarna. I have a very special guest today in our exemplary Catholic leadership series. It's John Cannon. He's the founder of Scent Ventures. And we're going to be looking forward to hearing uh, from John in the next few minutes here. Uh, before I do that, though, just a quick reminder that if you could take a look at our uh, www.thecatholicceo.com website, you'll see all sorts of interesting things that we're doing there. And particularly our project, The Catholic Economy, www.thecatholiceconomy.com. It's a place where Catholics with businesses are going to come together and we're going to help each other to promote each other's businesses, find each other buy from each other, sell to each other and with each other, and perhaps have capital and other ways of assisting each other. So hopefully you can take a look at all of those things. But meanwhile, let's get back to John. So John, how are you today? Doing well, thank you, Henry. Thank you for having me. It's a blessing. Yeah, it's very much a pleasure to have you with us. And you know, John, as we talked before, the, the idea of this series is People who are Catholics and run businesses and do things in the world and are trying not to be of the world, you know, it's interesting and it's inspiring for us to tell each other about these things. And so I'm glad that you're here with us because you have a very, talk about exemplary, you've done many uh, wonderful things. So I'd like to ask you uh, to begin with, tell us about your uh, faith journey and, you know, where did you come from and where are you now? And eventually we're going to talk about your business pursuits as well, but your faith journey, John, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you for thank you for asking about that. You know, God's full of surprises and he leads us through different paths that we don't expect. And um, so I've uh, bounced around a little bit. I like to say, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up because I've had different different careers and stages like like a lot of us. But, um, you know, after college, I um, I worked in politics briefly in my home state of Alabama. And then I was like, wow, this isn't really working. I need to learn business to learn how to get things done. And so I went to business school, got an MBA, and then uh, ended up working for an investment bank and starting a little boutique consulting firm. So I worked with uh, companies on growth strategy or um, marketing strategy and helped them help them to grow through this uh, consulting firm. I had grown up Catholic, but it became less and less part of the game as I went along. And um, I was, you know, trying to hustle, build my company. Um, and uh, I was not in a good place spiritually during the time. I was in a very kind of, you know, and kind of selfish from a career perspective. And then also in my relationships with others, it was um, very focused on what I could get out of it. And I wasn't really going to mass at the time. And, um, and uh, a lot of, I would say darkness internally. And God was very merciful to me during this time. I had a very intense spiritual experience that I can't really explain except for the fact that I knew that God existed um, and that I was a sinner. And when I experienced this and I felt like he was inviting me to change and um, literally overnight after this experience went from reading, you know, just business stuff and to uh, a lot of spiritual reading and spending time in prayer and um, finding a lot of healing and confession and going to mass regularly. And then I was like, I need mass <laughs> starting to mass every day. And then was like how do I give everything to God and so I started discerning religious life and ended up winding down the business I was running and entered um the Carmelites a more contemplative order in the church and was with the, was with them for some years in, in formation which was a great gift you know you have three to four hours a day for prayer um two holy hours and so when you do that like life's good everything's great and um it's just a great blessing being with them I eventually as I went further along felt that God was inviting me to kind of integrate this intense professional training I had with the spirituality and um, did a research project for my theology studies, looking at leaders who had led renewal efforts in the church. Like um, today's the feast day of St. Benedict, like St. Benedict or Mother Teresa of Calcutta and trying to understand the common characteristics of these leaders' lives. And um, as business leaders, we, you know, we, we study a lot of business figures and, and, okay, what are Steve Jobs' habits and how did this, you know, but what about these spiritual leaders that built organizations that have stood for hundreds, if not thousands of years? What, what allowed them to do that? What is what are their characteristics or their founding stories? So I studied that and you know identified some characteristics and in, in you know after looking at dozens of these leaders and seeing that they're you know one they're seeking God and, and, and a genuine holiness. Um, they're also very entrepreneurial. They find needs around them where they are and they try to address them. And uh, it just gave me a new way of thinking about renewal and new life in the church, much more from an entrepreneurial lens. And ended up discerning a religious life and starting. Uh, sent, which is the organization I run now, and really tried to um, 
support Catholic entrepreneurs and, and business leaders um, in a way that allows them to build their faith authentically into, into their business. And so really a network and community for these types of leader, types of leaders help, help them to access uh, coaching, mentorship, uh, peers like them, uh, as well as connect in person through conferences and, and, and retreats. No so way. I've been doing this for past, past, well, uh, I don't know when this will air, but as of now, at least the past couple, couple of years. Yeah. Excellent. You know, John, it's, uh, and we're going to hear a lot. I want to ask you a few questions about that, of course, because I think our, our audience will be very interested to hear about that. And, and yet I'm, uh, as you know, I was mentioning to you uh, just before we started recording this, that I had stopped in, um, on my road trip to Texas, I had stopped at the Clear Creek Abbey. And, you know, I observed uh, basically about 24 hours worth of uh, the prayer, Ora et Labora. And I found it very fascinating because there they are in the middle of um, a somewhat remote area, you might say. In fact, it's impossible to find if you don't have the right maps and the right uh, uh, GPS guidance on your vehicle. But I found that they're very entrepreneurial and they, because they are scratching out a living, you could say they're building a, a, a building and, a, and a, a monastery that will last a thousand years, but they're doing all sorts of businesses there. So in your, before we get to your business pursuits of the Scent Ventures, when you were there for a number of years, uh, discerning the Carmelite life, tell us about that entrepreneurial spirit, because they're, they're men of God and the, the, the abbot, let's say, would be a, certainly a man of God, but has to be a sharp entrepreneur too one would think yeah that's a good that's a good question i mean i you know i think yeah i've always noticed in myself kind of a more of an entrepreneurial drive to create things to build things to figure out new approaches um you know i've always been a little bit of a risk taker so i think that's part of it too you know um and i had started a you know a couple of businesses along the way and um i guess part of my spiritual journey was for me personally, it was, you know, I, I had so, I, there was a lot of kind of, um, um, hey, look at my resume and what I've accomplished in my journey. And so my, part of my journey during that time was like, just to kind of bury that and leave it behind. And I, so I kind of left, I was like, okay, we'll leave the entrepreneurship stuff because, you know, stop chasing those things and just surrender to, you know, maybe, yeah, to whatever, you know, a, religious life take a vow of obedience. So it's, you know, if you, <laughs> you want to start something that's not what the spirits want, then you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's what you accept out of humility. And so, you know, for me, it was like, I kind of had to intentionally leave that behind. Um, and I found in, in religious life, um, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think it depends. I think it's challenging in a lot of religious congregations, you know, a lot of it's culture, right. For entrepreneurship, some may have a culture of entrepreneurship and starting things. I think more broadly in the church, um, that's a challenge because, um, it's institutionally not necessarily set up. It's more institutionally set up for preservation than innovation in entrepreneurship. And I think on, you know, just, uh, you know, mathematically, statistically, it's, you know, there, you see kind of flatlining or declining in some areas. And so you try to manage, there's a, can be a tendency to kind of manage decline as opposed to innovate for growth or expansion. Um, I think there are pockets and exceptions to that, um, so, uh, you know, I think that was in, in, in the leaders I, I studied, I also observed that a lot of them kind of built their movements and, and things outside of in, kind of hierarchical or institutional structures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mother Teresa founding the Missionaries of Charity kind of on her own by herself, yes, yes. separately. Benedict going off to a cave, you know, and people joining him later on outside of the city. Um, St. Francis of Assisi wandering around with a sack in, in, in Assisi, you know, and so it's, it's interesting that that is a little bit of a pattern of how the Holy Spirit has worked. Um, uh, famous theologians such as um, Ratzinger, you know, Pope Benedict and Hans Rosemar Balthazar have also observed that that is a kind of a trend throughout church history is that the Holy Spirit provides new, new movements often outside of the hierarchical structures of the church. So I actually think that entrepreneurship in the church has happened more typically outside of traditional institutions than within. And you see a parallel in corporate settings too, like big companies notoriously have, because they, you know, there's institutional yes. structures that are necessary for the preservation and, and kind of steady growth of them. 
they to innovate, they either go through acquisition, they acquire, or they'll set up separate arms or, or, or units that are responsible for the innovation or development. Um, and so I think I think the church can learn can can learn from that also. This is very interesting. You know, uh, you and I are both, I guess you could say, investors. I'm an angel investor, run an angel investor fund, and you've done a lot of things, which we will hear about in a moment. You know, we 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 find that innovation comes. I mean, I see still a couple hundred deals a year of uh, innovative, creative startups where it's just amazing what what entrepreneurial spirit and creativity they show. So this is an important point that it, there could be a lesson here for us that some of the great movements uh, within the church, uh, which are bold and entrepreneurial, take place outside of the established structure. That's a very interesting, interesting point. And so, you know, it reminds me then at one point you you left the Carmelites, I guess. And did you then head out to start Scent Ventures and, and maybe tell us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I, um, yeah. after a long discernment process, as I mentioned, I was with the Carmelites for about seven years. So I was approaching, I was in, um, I had professed uh, what's called simple vows. So you make vows of property, chastity, obedience, and renew them each year. Um, and um, had, you know, felt God was leading me to maybe more active in, in kind of integrating this, you know, business into um, maybe be more mission oriented and, and active and, um, you know, and I, just to be candid, so I, I felt like I was calling me to the vocation of marriage and family, which was definitely not conducive with <laughs> the religious life. And that was kind of yes. consistent. So it was those two factors. And so my vows were up for renewal in 2019. And so I discerned to, you know, with the guidance of my superiors and, and, um, spiritual director, you know, to not, I did not renew the vows. And so by default was no one member of the community. And so discerned out through that, that pathway is kind of got into the mechanics a little bit, but have a lot of peace about, you know, um, that decision and, and God's guidance in it. And a big part of that was also like, yeah, I spent the last year in religious life kind of praying and just, I was just doing a lot of reading. I, I couldn't even help it. Just studying the lives of saints and founders and reading a lot of ecclesial history and um, how movements had happened in the church in different ways and just seeing some of these patterns and also began looking at order, you know, well, movements or congregations or um, organizations that had started recently and just just trying to study that landscape and just seeing that there's, um, you know, this, this trend of entrepreneurship and church renewal, and then just trying to think through what that, what that could look like today and um, trying to find ways of supporting leaders like this. So when I just turned out, I did, I, I don't think I had like a strategy document for Scent. I just knew I wanted to do something to support Catholic entrepreneurial leaders. And so I just went around and talked to people. I would travel around the country, going to conferences and meet with people and share about kind of the, some ideas I had and listen to what they were, you know, what they'd experienced and just try to learn. And, and, and from that, you know, learn some of the key pain points of, you know, Catholic, Catholic entrepreneurial leaders, which I think most people, most entrepreneurs share, but maybe a little bit more particular to Catholic leaders. And I think that's one, Hey, I want help with my strategy. How do I get from A to B, B to C Two, how do I access resources and networks, whether it's capital or getting in front of the right people three, it's very isolating starting something, especially if you're trying to build your faith into it and you can't find the right allies or peers. I would love community to support me in this. And then four, spirituality, to grow my spiritual life while I'm building something. It's super hard to build something and grow in your spiritual life because you're so busy and you're, there's a lot of stress. Maybe you have a family too. And so how do you do all that and grow closer to God? And so trying to develop some uh, solutions, if you will, or approaches to address these needs that are that are rooted in um, one, what works in kind of the, you know, more secular uh, ecosystem. And then two, building in all I've learned from Catholic formation and religious life and studying different movements and, and saints throughout history, how to blend those together in a way that could really help these types of leaders. It's a very, uh, it's a very powerful uh, set of issues that you, you bring together this way. You know, at the Catholic CEO, we're, we constantly talk about how a Catholic business owner, let's say, operates in the world, not of it, but operates a business according to, let's just say, you know, standard business practices or principles, but at the same time brings the Catholic component. Could you tell us, you know, you're working with people, you're helping people solve these things. 
things. What's the, John, what's the secret? What's the formula for how you combine business operation with the Catholic faith? How yeah, I mean, yeah. And as you know, too, like there's no silver bullet or secret to anything in life. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you, um, you work through it, uh, everything like day to day in the midst of your, in the midst of your life and journey and ups and downs. And, you know, we, so I think that's, I think accepting and realizing that's super important is, is, you know, um, you know, I think, I think that, you know, I think there's an ordering to, to how leaders or anyone approaches these things. I think there can be a tendency to, um, you know, just focus externally on things. You know, if I have this mission or if we get this type of growth or outcome, you know, we'll be set or that'll, that'll solve the problems or that's the solution. Um, whereas the real journey is much more of an internal one um, and an ordering of things in that um, I, you know, work first on my relationship with God, work first on my relationship with myself, work first in my relationship with others. And, and that from that core can go out to, you know, think then about how that actually builds into my company and the values of my company. But if you have, if you have the secret sauce of how Catholicism interfaces with your company, but you're struggling with deep mortal sin and yelling at employees all the time, like it's not going to work. Right. And so what does that journey look like for the, for the founder or the CEO first is, is kind of how we approach things. And so really, I think, you know, and one that, that starts like the saints, guidance. Yeah, Teresa of Avila says, you know, all, be, all holiness begins with self-knowledge, being aware of yourself. And so, you know, having a, a, a sense of your, who you are. And so I think various assessments can be helpful for that. Um, so we have some assessments that we'll offer to leaders to help them develop, grow in self-knowledge and, and where they're strong and where they hope to grow. Um, and then two, you know, um, you know, in business, going through vision setting, you know, we do a lot of vision, visioning, vision setting in business. And I think that can be done with the Holy Spirit too. And listening to where God's leading you for the future and then setting some, setting some, some markers or goals around that. And then I think three, um, having a plan for getting there. So um, that's what, you know, talked about the Benedictines earlier, rule of life, the rule of St. Benedict, having a rule for your life is a boat to help get you to your vision and where you want to go. Um, and having that in an integrated way, it's not just business goals, but you know, any any rule of life in the in the Catholic tradition, um, especially the Benedictines, has several components. One, there's a spiritual component to it. Two, there's a personal personal component to the Benedictines. Have time for you know personal self care and rest and that sort of thing. Benedict is clear to put that in his rule. And then um, you know, three, community. Um, so what is your intentionality around your family or community? And then work. Um, how are you approaching work in a way that um, is industrious, intentional, driven towards the right ends and, you know, builds faith into that in some way. Um, so we try, you know, I think it, when we flourish as humans, we're able to harmonize these different components. Um, so I think it starts there. And then, you know, and then you can layer on the next, the next phase, which is, okay, what does it look like in a business from like a culture standpoint or from a, a value standpoint or from a marketing strategy standpoint? Um, and I think, you know, there, there are probably some norms, but may depend on the context and type of company as well. So a very interesting. Also, what you've said is that you really start with your own personal relationship with God, your own spiritual growth, and then you don't sort of lay over your business Catholic principles. You must first have the close relationship with God yourself have that spiritual foundation, if I understand. And then it begins to shine forth. And then you can layer these other things on like practices in your business and, and good plans and things like that. And so <clears throat> that's, that's perhaps a powerful, the most powerful point is start with your own spiritual journey or your own spiritual growth. And, and how do we do that, John? What, what would be, I mean, you've outlined some of them, but what would be a formula for how we would take a look at our own spiritual life first before we start to apply it to our business. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're very, very succinct in summarizing. I just rambled for 20 minutes and you summarized it very That's well. That's great. No, no, no. <laughs> but, very uh, helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and I say one nuance to that too is it's, I think there's a staging <laughs> bit, right? Working on our own relationship with God, our spiritual journey, um, but also recognizing that's never done. We're always beginning anew. And so, I think we start there, but you can also begin to integrate things into your business. Um, 
along that journey, you know, because if you wait till you're at the spiritual end, you're going to be dead, right? So that's right. We'll never <laughs> achieve the proper spiritual uh, yeah. level. You know, the pursuit of virtue, we may never get to perfection. We'll be still in the, as, as many people have uh, commented, my friends, you know, we're all in the purgative way. And, and the purgative way is the first level. And in the purgative way, you have to stop sinning venially. That's the first lowest level step. Right. So yeah, and the saints are, you read the saints and, and you know, it's just like, wow, it's um, yeah. The, the bar is very high. It's very high. Um, yeah. So uh, the original question was, Oh yeah. Spiritual growth and journey. Yeah. I mean, I mean the key, I mean, it's, it's so beautiful in, in, in our faith because it's like, it's all handed to us. You know, it's not like I go out and I got to invent anything. It's like, it's there. Go to mass, <clears throat> go to confession and, Right, you know, mm -hmm. these are like the core building blocks, the sacrament mm -hmm. that Jesus yeah. gives in the church, and so mm -hmm. being faithful to that, and I mean, the, you know, it's like you don't have to invent some new. I mean, the thing it's been there for thousands of years. So, you know, I, I think the and it's beautiful too because it, it. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, you know, I, I, confession is so powerful. Is it just it clung? I mean, I, you know, and I for me, it's you know, going is like. I just there's so much lightness afterwards and clarity and freedom yeah. and peace internally for myself, but then also to make decisions in a, in a business or a, a leadership context, because I can see what the right path is much more clearly because the fog of, you know, where I've been, where I'm divided in myself and from God is, is, is cleared out a little bit. And so it's just very powerful. And the same with mass and receiving the Eucharist is that Christ gives us grace to like, to, to I mean, for example, if I'm faithful and going to, to mass and take, I usually try and take um, the saints consistently, like Teresa of Avila, St. Francis de Sales, others consistently advise at least 30 minutes a day for mental prayer for anyone. Um, yes. So just quiet time with God to let him, you know, to build that relationship with him. So I think any leader, you know, can find time for that and, and needs it. Um, and the clarity for decision-making and leadership emerges and you know, you're going to build a better culture with your team and they're going to respect you more and, and you're going to be in a better position to lead. So it's, I think it's one of the highest ROI things a leader can do is invest in their, in their prayer and sacramental life um, and being faithful to that. Um, and they're going to be happier and more at peace as well. Yeah. You know, uh, adoration. Can you comment about adoration? Going to adoration, I find at least has brought me some of that, that serenity, that peace, that clarity. Do you find that do you do your clients and your people tell you that? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I don't. I mean, we haven't done like a survey on that. I mean, I, mm. I certainly have been a <laughs> it's certainly transformed my life. And sure. um, you know, I mean, I, there's a powerful you know um, um, intensity of Christ's presence and adoration mm. of the Blessed Sacrament. And you know, I mean, that's like the church lingo for it. I guess my experience is like I go to adoration and like I often just. I mean, it's when you allow Him to. One of my one of my Carmelite mentors, very holy priest, you know, I was asking him about, you know, how do you pray? And I was asking him something similar about adoration. Like, how is it? He's like, adoration is like, well, he's like, I think he's just saying prayer in front of the Blessed Sacrament generally. It's like, he's like, it's like sunbathing, you know, it's like going to, the, you know, you go to the beach and you strip down as much as you can and you just, you just soak in the rays and you're glowing afterwards. And that's, that's kind of a summary of it. You kind of leave as much, you know, as much as you can behind to just be, available and present to soak in the rays and then you can radiate those rays afterwards you can radiate christ through you afterwards and i think adoration adoration is very powerful for that and i you know maybe one one you know i think there are some more specific ways like the faith can be integrated you know that can flow through business relationships too i think another way to think about prayer in respect to business and leadership is too is like and this something i'm trying to grow more in is how do you pray for the people you know the, on your team how do you how do you, you know if they're if they're you know there's friction with teammates or challenges in that how are you bringing that into prayer so that that's sanctified you allow the holy spirit to kind of go ahead of you and do the hard work and i think if people you do that consistently with teammates or colleagues or even competitors partners mm -hmm. um, in business you're going to bring a lot of grace into there and you're going to see things in business work in the way that kind of is most optimal for you um may not be what your original strategy was, but it's going to be the best path for you. So opening up those channels for grace to work in your, even your business relationships can be really powerful too. It's, it's very, uh, I love that analogy that you gave about the rays and, and sort of basking in the, in the sunlight, in the sunshine. Um, <clears throat> when we do this, John, you know, we, we, we pursue virtue 
we grow in holiness, we uh, avail ourselves of the sacraments, we, we do all these things to uh, create some serenity and peace in our life and some direction and some focus. And, you know, God speaks uh, to us and we, we then use our natural given talents like you have, for example, and then you go out and do things. I'd like to focus a bit for a, a few moments on some of the key questions that people are asking us these days, and maybe you're getting these questions too. You know, uh, you hear talk about ethical investing. You hear talk about, um, you know, how should I treat my employees specifically? What do you think about all of that? Let's say you're pursuing virtue and you're doing, you know, never perf perfect, or, but you're achieving, uh, you know, growth along the way. What do you do about these questions of ethical investing or how do I treat my employees or how do I use marketing methods that are not manipulative or exploitive, things like that? Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, I, you know, um, I, those are all probably, you could have discussions for hours on any of those topics and I don't pretend to have answers for that at all. They're very hard uh, questions that I think I can, maybe I can comment on, you know, maybe I'll pick one, um, Sure. you know, and I think, you know, investing and, and, and what that looks like, um, you know, and there are different, different approaches to it. I mean, so like, you know, um, yeah, I think are all, you know, different. Yeah, there are different approaches to it. So, I mean, take, take like the Notre Dame endowment, for example. And it's, a, you know, multi-billion dollar endowment that, and it's a Catholic institution. And so they, you know, they have gone through a, a process for making uh, investment decisions that are aligned with the faith. And then basically their, their threshold for investing is we are not going to invest in anything that, um, and I may not have the exact legal language that they have, but effectively does not contradict the, you know, anything that does not contradict, you know, the Catholic faith or Catholic teaching, um, you know, which, you know, there's still a level of subjectivity in because there may be companies they invest in that promote, you know, things on their websites that may be inconsistent with Catholic teaching or, you know, have themselves, you know, so have programs that are inconsistent with Catholic teaching. Like, in fact, now that would be very difficult, I think, to invest in any, almost any public company that has no affiliation with anything that's <laughs> counter to the Catholic right. teaching. So, um, I think right. it gets. I think it gets. I think it's an evolving issue that's quite quite challenging. Um, you know. So anyway, that's one threshold. And then on the other end, you could say that you know I'm only you know there in the middle there are things where maybe like okay ethical investing that um, you know invests in some cause or issue that may be consistent with Catholic social teaching in this case. So um, you know you could argue. Um, uh, care for the poor or health care, um, you know, or, um, you know, even environmental issues. Um, of course, there's even difficulty in that, too, because there may be other things that companies or organizations do that may be contradictory to the faith. Um, and so, you know, and then maybe the extreme would be, okay, only investing in companies or, or groups that um, are aligned, you know, they're actually Catholic or aligned completely in every single way with you know, Catholic, Catholic doctrine or values, and maybe even pushing it forward, um, which becomes smaller. And maybe it's like a funnel to the number of companies out there that you could invest in down to ones that are like, okay, you know, super pro Catholic or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think, you know, I, I don't pretend to have like a solution for that or an answer, because also I think, you know, um, being able to, uh, you know, from a practical perspective, take a case of a family, right. That they're, you know, have it, let's say you got, you know, Catholic family that has five, six, seven kids. I don't know. And you have, you're working hard in your job and you want to pay for those kids schooling. And it's very difficult to do that if you're not able to invest that money in a way that yields return over time. Otherwise you just put it under the mattress, you lose it to inflation. So, you know, there's a good in being able to provide for your kids future. And that's a direct responsibility that you have. Whereas the culpability for investing in a company that maybe kind of not consistent with Catholic values is so remote and removed that the ethics for in your case, may be like, well, I really need to make sure I provide for my family. And for, you know, the responsible way to do that is to make sure I have growth capital to do it. And if I just do super Catholic stuff, the risk return ratio is so low that, you know, so there's just, there's a lot of variability in the ethics in the ethical dimension for these things, I guess, depending on the situation, I would say the key for any type of just question like this um, is to one, understand 
I guess, your obligations and responsibilities, your duties in life, um, who you, who God is entrusted to you, if that is a family, if that is certain business stakeholders, if that is fiduciary responsibility to invest LPs or whatever, um, to understand that, first of all, and be faithful to it to the extent you can without violating your faith. And then two, discernment, using discernment principles. Uh, and so Ignatian discernment principles are so powerful in this context of like go back to prayer. I mean, so much comes back to prayer is like bringing that to prayer and trying to really listen to where God is leading you in this. And if he's leading you, um, you know, how he's guiding you in that process. So I think those are kind of two levers and tools. I've talked a lot. I will say that the other piece of it is, I do think there is a lot of opportunity to move because these things aren't just like, we can't just be reactive. I think we also have to be proactive with things. And there is an opportunity to move towards okay, well, let's, how can we be more proactive in investing and moving capital to companies and projects that are aligned with faith and teaching? I mean, that can make a huge impact too. You can be proactive. I mean, think of the, you know, capital pulling out of South Africa and the apartheid and that being a major catalyst for shutting down the regime there. I mean, so it doesn't, you don't just have to follow the market. You can be a proactive leader. I think the keys in making those steps are also just recognizing who God is asking you to be responsible to and, um, and using, you know, appropriate discernment tools for making those decisions. This is, as you have rightly pointed out, and I think we would, we would definitely agree on this, uh, you and I, it's a difficult question. You know, the remote material cooperation matter versus your obligation and your vocation as a father, as a husband, as a provider for your family. It's, it's a very complex matter, but I think you've said the, the, perhaps the most uh, valuable thing of all, which is it, we need to discern and pray about this. It's not just a, a flippant decision. It's not a formulaic decision, is it? It's really something that requires that. And so, uh, <clears throat> but you've also said a couple of interesting things that I, I want to pursue um, capital for sure. And I want to just take, ask you one more question about, let's say you're, uh, <clears throat> you're, you're, an, you're an, a business owner and you're, you know, you have children to send to university or to train for the future life and that sort of thing. Um, what do you do about the, when the culture keeps pressing in on you, you know, the, these questions become even more pronounced, the, the balancing between uh, your obligations and the sort of cooperation, the, the, the economy is so, you know, filled with groups and organizations and companies that would be inimical to the Catholic faith in, in much of their work. And so, you know, there's a transition to, I want to, I want to ask you a question about transitioning from, uh, let's ask, actually, that's the question. Transitioning from an employee status to, let's say, becoming an entrepreneur, what would you say about that? And then later, I want to ask you about the capital question, because there's a lot of questions about that one. But transitioning, if you're an employee and the culture is pressing in on you, you know that you're going to be, you're, you're a downtown corporate job, and you're going to be asked to do some stuff soon, or maybe already are, and you just can't do it. You know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of those stories. I've heard a lot of those stories. You know, praise God, I've been able to work in like a, you know, sanctioned faith-based environment um, where you pray meetings. And, um, but, you know, I talked to someone the other day and she said that she was doing marketing and they, you know, wanted to, she was asked to do a campaign that, you know, was promoting issues that were contrary to the faith. And she pushed back on it and said she wasn't going to do it. And they, they were like, okay, well, we'll get someone else to do it. Um, you just need to, well, you just design this logo this way that still is contrary to her beliefs. And she, she was like, no. And then, you know, then anyway, she ended up quitting the job because it was ha- just because it was happening within her department and there was so much pressure around it. They, you know, they didn't ultimately ask her to do any of those pieces of it, but it was still happening. She's so she, she was like, I'm quitting. Cause it's, I can't, you know, um, and I, I get emails from people that are feel pressure and they need to leave their job. They feel like their conscience did not allow them to stay in their, their current position anymore. And they're hoping to find a place that they can, um, that their faith will be respected. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's, I think becoming increasingly difficult out there. And so, you know, entrepreneurship may be a path for some people, you know, I have got this dream project I've always wanted to try out or a company and to go into that. And, I, and so we have worked with some people that are in that, in that kind of phase. And I think there's two, there's two kind of like, personas for that the one is like i'll jump and figure it out later you know and the other is yeah, that's like, right yeah 
let yeah. me let me dip my toe in the water see how yeah. cold it is and then i'm yeah. gonna a leg and then yeah. you know and i think that comes down to discernment yeah. too it's like yeah. you know well you know you have to know your personality type and have you done this before do you have experience that would lead you to believe that it's going to be successful do you have the right partners like how many do you have you know are you by yourself and just got to care for you or do you have eight kids you know like there's a lot of kind of variables in that. I don't think there's a right answer for, you know, do you jump all in or do you kind of ease into it? Um, you know, so I do think, you know, this current startup methodology and approach around iteration and kind of like testing and revising yes. um, is is effective generally, but especially in this type of, you know, discernment process. It's like, well, let's test and see how it goes, test and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, so those are some those are some reflections on it um if that's all born yeah it, there's there's an increasing number of people again that you've encountered them and so have i people have come to us and they say you know all i have to do is burn one grain of incense you know that analogy uh to the roman gods and uh, so you're you're the example you gave of the woman who you know basically ended up quitting the job i've heard that story many times and in fact i've heard it uh and i know you have too the different version of it which is you know, in a, in a certain parish in Vancouver that I know well, 35 people, that, that would be 35 families, that um, the breadwinner lost the job for conscience reasons in the past two years. Wow. And so, you know, I made an offer to work for them pro bono to whoever was interested. I told the priests, whoever was interested in starting a business, I would work with them. I would coach and mentor them on a pro bono basis. And I think there's about eight or 10 that I have been working with and it's going to turn out to be probably five of them will actually start a business of their own to escape that pressure that they were under because they, in some cases they can never go back to their, you know, their chosen profession. They cannot go back because they're completely blackballed, you could say, and they're, and they're out of it. So this, you know, the entrepreneurial pull is very interesting. And this leads me to the capital question that I was going to ask, because in this example that I gave you, there are people who said, you know, I'd love to do a startup. I'd love to, use in my parish, you know, smart business people that could create an advisory uh, group or, a, a, you know, a, a process where we could help each other. So we're trying to do that in, in that parish, and it seems to be working. Ultimately, though, capital. And so can we, and John, are you doing this? Is Scent Ventures promoting this? Are you creating pools of capital that will invest in Catholic businesses and still expect a return, I suppose, but also invest in the Catholic angle? Is, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. So, I mean, it is a it's definitely a need that, uh, yeah, obviously you've encountered, and we hear a lot for people that we support, or even those that, or this profile of of person is is, you know, to to grow any business or organization, you need fuel to do that, and and there are different ways of doing that, and uh, but capital is, you know, is a necessary component at, at some stage and at different, arguably most stages, and so, um, and then having being able to you know if you want if you're want to build faith or at least have the culture of the culture of the values of the company insulate protect and, and nurture faith having value partners capital partners that align with those values is super important because they're going to drive a lot of the growth decisions and trajectory of the company in the leadership and maybe have roles in like who's on the leadership team and so um finding those types of partners is, is super important um you know and it's something that you know you know as of now we you know sometimes we'll help founders kind of connect with people that may be able to help them in those ways um we don't at this time have any like type of fund or or capital um uh allocation strategy ourselves um but it is something that we hear a lot and you know i think in a more robust you know in, in an ecosystem that supports and nurtures capital entrepreneurship that would be a, that would definitely be a um, an aspect of it. Yeah, I I think so too. I think it's something that will emerge in, in the future because right now I think what what I'm discovering is that Catholics are wanting to find each other. Catholic entrepreneurs are simply wanting to find each other, speak about things openly, be able to talk about Catholicism and and their business. And there are lots of mechanisms out there, or increasing number of them out there that are coming about. And, and the capital question, I am fascinated by it because and I wanted to ask you, what do you think of this idea? You know, there are other uh, groups out there, religious, ethnic, and so on, that, you know, some of my good friends are in other uh, such groups like this. And they have said to me, you know, Henry, 
good you guys are finally figuring this out as Catholics, that you can become an economic force by helping each other in buying and selling and advising and putting capital pools together and even giving each other grants, you know, so to speak, to, um, to do that. Um, do you think, John, it's not a, I'm trying to load a question on you, but the idea of becoming an economic powerhouse and therefore changing the, the, the social practices, changing legislation, changing the culture by becoming an economic force, not in addition or in besides prayer and all the other things that the faith would bring us, but do you see any path there forward where we become an economic powerhouse and then we can change the culture? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, good question. I, I know you have, you have thoughts on that. Um, yeah. And, you know, I guess I don't think that's necessarily like a impossible. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess the way I would think about that is a little, a little different maybe in that. Um, I, I mean, throughout, I, I do think that primarily the way that Catholics are going to be able to um, evangelize, connect, transform culture more broadly is by first allowing themselves to be transformed. Um, if we all are able to radiate the light of Christ, um, people can't hide from that and they're going to be back. They're going to be drawn to it. And they're going to say, there's something different here. And I want to be a part of that. Um, and some of the greatest, you know, movements for evangelization have been martyrs, have been abject poverty, um, the Franciscans, um, you know, so religious take vows of poverty. Um, so I think, I think that, I think that has got to be fundamental and core to any um, strat, Holy Spirit strategy, not my, I don't have a strategy, Holy Spirit maybe has a strategy, but any type of strategy the Holy Spirit may have for what it looks like, what the church looks like in the future. Um, you know, that said, I think if there are leaders in groups that have that as a prerequisite and are moving more and more in that direction in terms of genuinely radiating Christ's light to others, um, you know, and are in positions that, you know, get others' attention, whether that's economic or other means, then, you know, that can, that can add additional, you know, influence to, to culture etc. I do think that, you know, generally culture, changes in culture precede changes in legislation and policy. I think as someone who's worked in politics and lives in DC, I think politics is largely a, is largely reactionary. Um, so uh, um, I would see like, you know, how, there's a movement towards genuine holiness and especially that I think, but I do agree that, and that's part of why we were working with Catholic founders and, and mission leaders is that if they can genuinely live, live Christ in their lives, that can flow through their teams, their organizations, um, their distribution channels, media, um, other ways. Like they, that's an outsized lever for impacting broader society. Um, and I think these leaders are out there and they're hungry for it. So um, I do think that's there. I think it's just kind of an ordering to, um, yeah, Jesus first and then business second yeah. well and that's the, that's the perspective and thanks for for mentioning that you know you think back to the to the roman empire at the time of uh, you know at the time of christ and and right after there was there was not an economic club christians that way they did it by the love that they showed and the the charity and just the the love of god that and that shine that shone forth in a way that uh, everybody was asking. We, we both know it. They used to say, "Well, you know, who are who are those Christians? Like, they're look at they're different from they're different from us. They're different, and and they're doing something different." So this is very interesting. It's very interesting. You know, another area too that I would love to have your opinion on: families. Families are raising, and uh, you know, we both are fathers, and in my case, I'm a grandfather at this point already. Um, children, young people are you know, they're living in this culture. What do we say? What do we say as perhaps entrepreneurs or just uh, people who are familiar with the business world? What do we say to the young person today? Like, how should you govern your life? Uh, what, you know, should you look at business as, a, as an outlet for yourself to, to perhaps insulate yourself a bit from the culture and so on? What would you say to a young person who's 
starting out on their next career move. They're 21 years old or 19 years old and they're looking for their future. What would you say to them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, and as a caveat to that, I, I'm, I'm not a father, I'm not a dad, I don't have kids myself, but um, was it, we had the privilege of having an amazing saintly father myself and also teaching um, one of my last years in religious life taught uh, seventh and eighth grade religion and PE. Ah, so ah, <laughs> I'm around kids quite a bit around this age or approaching this age. So, sure. um, you know, so uh, hopefully I can comment on it a little bit, but in a limited fashion. Sure, um, love to hear it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, again, like, I, you know, Benedict option, Roger argues, you know, again, if you say Benedict, it keeps coming up, but, you know, to preserve Christianity, Christian communities need to kind of, um, uh, kind of, you know, um, silo a little bit and protect the kind of remnant um, in very insular ways uh, so that they're prepared for a time when they can kind of reemerge. Roughly, that's what he argues, although I'm sure it's more nuanced than that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, I think for kids growing up, it's, I, I, I don't know, I think it's a similar blueprint though. It's look, you know, um, <laughs> stay, you know, here are the tools and the resources to stay close to God. I think we have traditionally in, in our faith tried to catechize rules and 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 um, specific dogmas of the faith, which is good. Um, however, in addition to that, the well, I think the most important thing is like if you te- if you're able to help form people in and show them how to have a deep relationship with God through prayer, through an intimate seeking of Him, and through the sacraments, that is gonna that's gonna give the tools and the resources to for their whole life and maybe principles of discernment and just, I think giving the tools and the space for them to have that relationship, bring them to adoration, um, take them to daily mass from time to time, um, teach, you know, pray the examination of conscience with them at night so they can learn how, how to discern what's going on in their day. Um, those tools are going to be, I think, much more effective for them to then be able to discern where God is leading them in their lives. And that may be a business path. It may be, it may be a blue collar path. It may be religious life, you know, but if they have those tools, they'll be able to listen to the Holy Spirit's uniquely leading them in that. Um, with respect to the business pathway or the entrepreneurship pathway, um, I think I think it is something that, um, I mean, as, as someone who's kind of built that way and loves it and feels called to it, I, I feel comfortable kind of evangelizing that to younger people mm-hmm. too, saying this is really great. You should give this a shot. Like, even in class, if I was, if I led a high school class, I'd be like, all right, this class, we're all going to like build a micro company, you know, and yeah, exactly to do it and see how it goes and learn from that and give them those tools. Also, like go do a lemonade stand, go, you know, be an entrepreneur for a day or I'm giving you a dollar. I, someone, someone told me it's like, there was some, it was a business class or a teaching, they did, but it, it, you know, it's like they gave someone a dollar or $5 and they said, all right, in a week, I want you to come back with a hundred. And you can't do anything illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You need to figure out how to no like, flipping. Yeah, 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 yeah. Aggregate yeah. capital in like ethical ways or whatever. Yeah, and so, yeah. you know, I think those types of little experiments can be great. Can be great didactic, uh, instructional lessons for for young people. Just emp- it's empowering. It's like, wow, I can go out and build something and create something. And it's beautiful in the United States and in Canada too. Our, you know, the foundation of our our country is really built upon enterprise and. Ec- entrepreneurial activity immigrants coming over with nothing my granddad came from lebanon with nothing and he traveled through the rural north carolina countryside with a sack on his back to sell wares to people you know in the teens and the 20s and 30s and eventually earned up enough money to have his own department store and like buy a beach house and put kids through college but it's amazing you can do that and so showing kids that that's possible i think is also very empowering for them it can give a freedom to like to it, um, build God into their life in a way that, um, you know, allows them to hopefully care for their family, but then also build deep spiritual practices into it. Yeah, this is, this is great. And your, your theme today in our talk is, is coming through loud and clear several times now, John. It's, you know, foundationally the faith. Frequent the sacraments, go to mass, go frequently, go to adoration, you know, do read the spiritual lives, have mental prayer. These these things you've said today are all about the foundation. And then from that, you can discern and you can decide if you have the entrepreneurial talent, good. If not, if it's the religious life or it's something else, good. 
but your foundation is important. So I think you've said some very important things uh, today about that. You know, I, I was also a moment ago, I was chuckling to myself because in, uh, you know, I'm in Texas visiting um, my family and my granddaughters are uh, entrepreneurially minded because their parents are entrepreneurially minded as is their grandfather. And so there's uh, going to be uh, in, you know, in Sugarland, Texas, there's going to be a little roadside stand with little trinkets and, and bracelets that the girls are making. They're 12 and uh, or 11 and, and seven. And so they're going to be doing this. And so, you know, it's, but they're understanding that this is how it works. You, you can do this. And so anyway, it's kind of a, it's kind of a fun thing. That's it's amazing. Thing. So cool. yeah, you have to go down there and pick one up. Yeah, exactly. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll do the marketing. We'll let you know. I'm teaching them how to do the social media and the marketing. So <laughs> Great. yeah, here's another area that I wanted to cover with you, John, um, you know, family business or home-based business. Love to hear your input on that because we're getting a lot of people coming to us and saying the way they're going to transition out of the corporate job, the downtown job or the corporate industrial job, whatever, is to come to a perhaps a family business or at least a home based business and get started that way. What do you what are you seeing about that? And what do you what do you think about that as a possible avenue for you know uh, to pursue for people? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think it. I mean, if you can, yeah, if you can make it work and um, I think it, I think it can be, yeah, we've, we've seen different companies like that, that, you know, merge out of the home or people trying things and it grows selling, whether it's candles or rosaries or, um, you know, cigars or, you know, yeah. um, you know, or even services, um, yeah, you know, I think that 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 certainly can be a be a viable path if that's something that um, you have the capability and and drive and um, you know can can do it. So um, yeah, and uh, I think another aspect of that is that you know I've seen you know some families where the kids are involved in things. Or, you know, it's kind of pretty pretty old old school in that way, um, which can be interesting involving kids in, in these things. I think. You know, there are challenges that come with that too. I, I don't pretend to have intimate knowledge of a lot of the family-based businesses too, but you know, there, you know, when you kind of build family and work all together, there can be good in that. And there can also be challenges of not having that separation between work and family life yeah. and um, risks associated with commingling those worlds, which are often um, demarcated. So, you know, I think discerning just appropriately those risks and, um, you know, because if there's a falling on the business side, can that affect relationships or someone's not pulling their weight? Um, how do you correct them in an appropriate right. way? You can, can't fire them like you would in a business or, right. you know, so, or maybe you can, but what does that look like? And how does the relationship preserve, you know, because there, there are cases of family businesses. And I guess for me, my family businesses, people go into business kind of as partners together in some capacity right. um, where there's a falling out and then that relationship never really heals. Um, and so, just being aware of those risks and discerning that I think is, is important. And, and again, going back to the iteration model, like try tests. If you're thinking of doing something like that, that, you know, like test it out. Hey, what's a little project we can work on just to see how it goes. And, yes. you know, and is this working for our relationship and is it successful? Like, let's not go too far. You know? And so I think those types of things, if they're sensitive relationship dynamics, you really want to ease into those things and test before or you kind of buy the whole car. Yeah, yeah. This is this is great advice. I think that the testing, the iteration model, as you called it. You know, some of the work I do as a consultant, uh, especially when I come into family business issues. You know, which hat are they wearing? And the you know the family hierarchy can be different from the business hierarchy, and so to play and move back and forth, it's extra complicated. The rewards, I think, are still extra extra great. Uh, I come myself from a family business, third generation, and and I know that uh, you know. For example, a consensus uh, model is really, you know, rather than a hierarchical kind of uh, direct uh, command system model is, is probably workable, but it's very complicated to learn that and it's very difficult. So it's good advice. It's to, I like what you said, John, it's the testing, the iterative kind of step-by-step, -step, I guess, do the lemonade stand or raise the rabbits or, I don't know, get some chickens or something and see if it actually works. And then... Uh, and then you can go corporate. You can have, uh, you know, you can raise ten million and do something big. But uh, start with the rabbits or the or the lemonade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. You, I'm sure you could talk about this a lot more. Now you've been in family businesses. I, I, 
I have oh, my granddad was, but I haven't been so. Yeah, well, there are increasingly people that you know uh, the the homeschooling families where there's one income, for example, and under pressure these days with inflation and so on. I do detect anecdotal. It's not I can't prove it. There's no survey we've done, but I, I have detected some interest in people testing out, and it's not prepper mentality either. It's kind of a uh, it's somewhere in between that. Whereas people saying, well, look, let's supplement our income. Let's maybe prepare for some harder times ahead if that's what's coming, if there is, in fact, a recession. And in fact, if we are going to in, into a, a tougher period, well, let's have some kind of alternatives. Let's have a garden. Let's have some other things. And so we are, and I'm trying to encourage that with people too, because it's a way, perhaps it's the John Cannon model. It's the, it's the way to test something, have a little garden and see if you can grow some produce, not for necessarily sale, but to, to um, you know, supplant expenditures, to cut expenditures in the family and so on. So you know, that's, uh, that's something that's quite interesting. Why don't we do this, John? There's so many more things we could talk about, but how about today, uh, as we come to a natural end for this, this uh, conversation, where do we find you? What's, what's going on? Do you have any events coming up? What are some things that you're selling and doing? And, and how do we find out where your offers are, that sort of thing? Can you give us that information? Yeah, yeah, we'll, this will be in the show notes, John. We'll put these all in, in detail later. But Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for asking. So, yeah, send ventures, uh, sendventures.com. We serve and support uh, Catholic entrepreneurs, CEOs, mission leaders, um, help you to grow your business in a way that integrates your faith and help connect you to a broader network of peers and um, partners. Uh, we do that through, hey, you're trying to grow your business and grow strategy or raise money. We can help connect you with a mentor that is values aligned. Um, we also have Peer coaching groups, young presidents, YPO, young presidents organization style peer coaching groups where you can be linked with five day to other CEOs or founders um, and with a coach and we'll go through a year long kind of growth journey and help you address strategy problems you may be facing, set goals and vision and attain it. And we have a spiritual curriculum that's customized for entrepreneurs as a part of that. And then we also have kind of a basic membership um, where you can access community platform and resources and weekly workshops and, and that sort of thing. We'll have a uh, we have annual summit, so everyone's invited to that. Uh, we haven't announced where, and it'll be for probably spring 2023. But we'd love for you to check us out at sinventures.com for future event information and um, any membership information. And definitely feel free to reach out to our team or me if you have questions. We'd love to talk with you, meet you, even if you're not not interested in joining or not now, just to make a connection and talk. We would we'd very much value that and learn how we can serve you in some way. That's great, great, John. And you just had a, a maybe a last word about the. You just had a summit, a conference recently, didn't you? And uh, what uh, what went on at that one? Maybe you could just fill us in a little bit as we close here. What what actually went on at that conference? What is yeah, it, it was it was great. Yeah, I think it's just such a hunger for as, as we're talking about these types of leaders, Catholic entrepreneurs, and CEOs to connect in person. Um, so we called the summit Holy Collisions. So mm -hmm. able to collide together, but have God be a part of that, and had over a hundred. You know, CEOs, um, investors, uh, mission leaders come in person, and we we're you know beginning it was like, hey, checking your ego at the door. You've all done great things, but <laughs> we're just here. You know, we're here to learn how to integrate faith more into our business and meet other people who care about similar things. And it was had great feedback from it. It was a combination of you know typical conference things of speakers and panel discussions on you know faith and VC investing, faith and tech. Um, to, uh, we, you know, had, uh, small groups where you'd be linked with other people kind of in a similar group grouping to you. And you'd have discussion topics on challenging things on like, you know, how, how are you, how do you navigate building a business and family life or personal situations and just raw, honest conversations around those things. You know, we have social nights where you have, you know, food and drinks and, you know, you can meet people and, so it's just a lot of fun, and but also people people walked away with some. We had to challenge everyone to walk away with some clear goals and objectives for for them um, coming out of it. So it's really powerful. Yeah, if you're a Catholic CEO or entrepreneur, definitely check us out and come join us for our next summit. That's great. Well, we'll look forward to uh, finding the location and the and the details of that. So so thanks, John. Again, it's you know there's so much more we could do, like we said, and we will call, we'll have another call at some time and, and talk further about these things. So thanks very much for being with us. God bless you and all of your ventures. And, uh, you know, that, that, that all will be successful and that you will fulfill the will of God. So God bless you.
Thank you. God bless you, Tanner. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So everyone, it's the Catholic CEO, Henry Katarna. Thanks for being with us today. My guest, John Cannon, founder of Scent Ventures. Very interesting. And uh, hope you check him out. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. <laughs>